Welcome to Podcasting Smarter, the podcast for podcasters by podcasters. Podcasting Smarter is the official podcast from Podbean, featuring podcasting interviews, best practices, and helpful tips. We're here to give you the tools, resources, product updates, and news to help you get started podcasting and keep your podcast growing. Hello, and welcome to Podcasting Smarter. This is Norma Jean Belenke, Podbean's Head of Events. And in today's episode, we'll be having a conversation with Sally Chom from Afro Queer and AQ Studios, where we'll get into starting your own production company, what she's learned along the way, podcasting on the African continent, and so much more. Stay tuned. And here we go. Hi, Sally. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you for having me, Norma. We are so excited that you're here. Wow. Um, so just tell us a little bit about you before we jump in and get started, because I want to talk about AQ Studios and Afroqueer and all the work that you do. But first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey of how you got into podcasting. Oh, it's such a it's such a good story, I think. <laughs> well, actually, I started off as a journalist. I started off as a journalist working in uh, New York City and actually worked uh, for a year with the StoryCorps project um, out of Brooklyn. That was actually one of my first radio jobs. I was a producer for the African-American initiative for StoryCorps. But right before I started at that uh, particular job, I began collecting uh, the stories of LGBT Africans, kind of by accident, actually. So I am Senegalese American. Um, and growing up, it was really isolating, you know, being a queer person, um, also being an African person. It was really difficult to find any spaces where those two identities met. People were really closeted at the time. And I remember feeling very much like I was the only queer African on the planet, um, which is, of course, now I know it's not true. But at the time, I remember feeling that way. Um, and so when I one day I was coming home and I saw uh, one of our local papers in Chicago um, that said that a lesbian activist from Sierra Leone, which is a West African country, had actually been murdered. Um, and it was the first time that I had heard that any kind of activism work or LGBT work was happening um, in West Africa, where, where I'm from. And it really galvanized me to start collecting oral histories audio-based oral histories of Africans that identified as LGBT. So I started traveling first in North America, um, so throughout the United States and Canada, and then eventually to West Africa, to Senegal, to Gambia, South Africa, and then eventually to Kenya, um, where I set up offices uh, for what is now AQ Studios. Um, so I did. that's the journey towards um, making Afroqueer. But, but, but between that, I was also working at NPR, The New York Times, PBS. So I kind of got a lot of my journalism and training jobs in the United States. Yes, absolutely. And you have you have that traditional journalism background. And I just want to ask you before we jump into AQ Studios and that incredible journey, what were some of the things from that journalism background with some of those you know traditional outlets that brought skills to your podcasting work? Yeah, I, I, mean, I learned how to structure story and tell good story, um, particularly starting out at uh, StoryCorps, which is Dave Isay's um, project. And he's, um, for folks who don't know, is, is kind of a pioneer in terms of, you know, audio storytelling in the United States. Um, and so really working under him, as I did for that year, was the beginning of me really beginning to understand how to construct a narrative arc and audio, um, and then going from there into other kinds of storytelling spaces uh, like PBS, where it was much more traditionally journalist approach, also taught me how to you know create stories in different kinds of ways. So every job I got, <laughs> every internship I got, was adding to my skill set to be able to tell stories that would you know eventually be the structure of Afroqueer. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to kind of dive into you know creating that arc of story later, but you kind of mentioned something that I just want to pull the thread on really quickly in terms of the difference between creating an arc of a story and that traditional journalism side of audio creation and production. So what have you noticed is kind of the main differences? Because in podcasting, we have so many different genres. News podcasts are on the rise. And so for everybody out there who you know may not have made that distinction consciously or in the front of their awareness, what would you say are the main differentiators between that story that hooks you and that journalism that informs you in terms of creating that work? Yeah, I really, you know, that's a really great question. For me, what that difference is, is especially in terms of the work that we do at Afroqueer, which is very documentary style, is there always is 
a strong character that takes us through a journey where they they transform every most every single time. And a lot of the traditional um, um, spaces that I worked in with journalism, there were definitely people that were going through things. I mean, they were telling stories, human interest stories, but they weren't necessarily the drivers of the narrative. Often, there was a lot of, especially what we do is in uh, Afro queer, where we want the people who are telling the stories to be the experts of that story. So oftentimes you will hear occasionally an expert's voice come in for particular kinds of stories, but we really try to stay within um, the character-driven narrative as the way, as the vehicle that pushes that story along. So those were some of the main differences there. We still have the same, the bones of reporting though. Even for any docu-style uh, work that we're doing, we're still reporting, we're still fact-checking, we're still, you know, checking the timelines, we're still going back and getting the context. We still have to do lots of research, no matter what kind of story we're telling. It's just figuring out how we're going to enter that story and who's going to carry that story to its conclusion. Oh, that's so beautifully put. Yeah. I mean, I love that you have that traditional side of the fact checking and, you know, just bringing it into everybody's reality in that linear way, but then also letting the lived experience of the guests or the subject really drive the story. So that's so beautiful. And I want to talk next about None on Record because that's your, you know, the stories of queer Africa that you were telling. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that was the the project. (laughs) (laughs) That was the project. Yes. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. Yes. So, I mean, it's important work, number one, but also, you know, how did it kind of bring you into the work that you do now? It's, it was, None of Rec was a very personal project uh, for me when I started the project in 2006. Um, and it, it really was because there wasn't a lot of information or there wasn't much of an archive yet of what was the stories, first person narratives of African LGBT people. And I very selfishly needed to know. I needed to know as an African LGBT person myself. And that level of invisibility, it weighs on you. It, it really can make you feel as though you don't belong, you know. And I think a lot of African um, folks can can identify with how strongly we are part of our families and our communities. It's a very important aspect. Um, to our cultural context. And so to be so outside of that and not seeing, you know, any stories or any history or, you know, any narrative reflecting as place even for myself or for others like me um, within the African context was really difficult, difficult for me at the time. So when I went about collecting, it was because, you know, of the death of Fanny and Eddie and, and realizing that there was things happening. So when I started to travel and collect, it was to build up this archive. And in my mind, it was it was for me, but it was also you know, this was brought from Europeans or this was, you know, this is a Western import. I didn't want that to be, you know, the narrative continue that way. Um, and I wanted to do my part to make sure that that changed so that, you know, the next generation had the, could see, you know, um, a past where they existed and therefore could feel that they they had a place in the present as well. Yeah. So absolutely. through that work, yeah, through that work, None on Record was founded and it became you know, what what I did and built up as an organization with some really incredible people for 10 years, actually. And then when we started Afro Queer Podcasts, we actually, in some ways, as, as things kind of have, have happened in the past, walked into a space because what we needed to do was to make a show. We were also making lots of film documentaries as well about African LGBT experiences, but the podcast was really special because one, we weren't going to get censored, which was a big, it was a big thing that was happening on the African concept, particularly in Kenya, where we're based. Any visual media films, you know, uh, any YouTube videos were getting censored and people were actually getting arrested for making queer content and distributing it online. Um, and so we couldn't, we couldn't go about, you know, making that content and safely distributing it. So in our, you know, knowing that we still wanted to tell stories, we decided to make a podcast and the podcast really took off. And from that, it took our work into training others how to use this medium as well to tell their stories um, and document their stories, um, but also to support the creation of other shows within within the African experience and also using podcasts as, as that vehicle. So it's kind of just kind of gone. <laughs> right. Sort of off. Right. Sort exactly. Of off exactly. Sort of you got on it. the train and it left the station. <laughs> yeah. And we kind of didn't know how to, we were like, okay, where's it going? We're just going to see, oh, okay. I think we have an idea. Okay. We got this. <laughs> so yeah. here we go. And yeah. that's such a great example of creating what you wanted to see in the world or what you wished had been available. Number one, I think for a lot of podcasters out there, it's really about, you know, creating the work that they want to listen to, creating the stories that they want to feel heard or that um, 
that offer representation in a way that wasn't available previously. So that's super, super important. And then also, you know, in terms of bringing it, you know, global, right. And, and Mm -hmm. just kind of, you know, watching it, you know, almost take spark and kind of, you know, ignite so many people and so many stories, number one. Mm -hmm. And then number two, the fact that podcasting as a medium really lends itself to so much expression and that it's safe for a lot of communities that are marginalized. So that's Mm -hmm. such an important aspect And I want to go back a little bit to none on the record or sorry, none on record, because just before, you know, it takes off and and all of that and, you know, it snowballs into all the other work of yours that I want to talk about. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) What what was the impact of that? I mean, sometimes seeing the work that we create, seeing other people have an experience with that work is really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was it was extraordinary. I mean, it, it definitely transformed me and it, and it healed me and I can speak from personal experience, but I know that it, it meant a lot to so many people who interacted with the archive and also with the films that we were making um, and all the cultural spaces that we created to have discussions about LGBT issues, but also LGBT media. We would get emails and, you know, <laughs> what's up, mas- what's up messages and you know, I would get, we would finally get my tech, my phone number, I get text messages all the time, but people were really talking about how much the work meant to them. Uh, and in the early days, because as we were building the archive, I would also oftentimes be the first person who had come to people to ask them to, to tell me their story. And it's such an intimate experience to, 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 t- to sometimes collect a story where someone's talking about, you know, the love that their mother had for them and this really big hardship that forced them to, you know, to leave, you know, where they grew up and then, you know, their search for love and those kinds of things. Um, and so in the early days in particular, you know, I ended up collecting a thousand stories or so. But in those early days, it really, really was a bond between, you know, the first like, you know, 50 people that I interviewed and they became such a, a huge part of my life. And, you know, I was also a part of theirs in a lot of ways. So it was always about building community through storytelling, creating visibility through storytelling. And then as things grew, it was, you know, we're going to distribute this. How how do we, you know, digitally distribute these stories so that we can reach people wherever they are so they can have access to them and they can, you know, feel like, you know, they're part of something. And that was a huge part of the mission of what we were doing at None of Record um, for, for 10 years. And it was fantastic. And it was so empowering. I mean, I really, I really felt like it was some of the funnest time of my life <laughs> to be doing that work. Um, and it was also, you know, sometimes, it, you know, people always ask me like, well, was it dangerous? And yeah, you know, it was um, in some ways. But it was also such a joyful experience to to come into, you know, like a small village and, you know, see, you know, be welcomed to a small LGBT organization that I think if people didn't know it was there, no one would see it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And be in fellowship with people who have been organizing themselves quietly, but were finally getting ready to tell their story. It was just a, such an exciting 10 years, honestly. And I'm really proud of that work. And we're right now we're putting it together into an archive, actually, that we're going to have co-hosted with uh, Google Arts and Culture, which is so exciting because it's going to be available to people all over the world. Um, and it was important to us to make it accessible um, for people to to have it and and the design of that. It's, and I'm just really excited about finally showcasing, you know, a decade's worth of work around yeah. documenting African. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that, you know, creating community through storytelling, number one. And then also, you know, that moment of having that one-on-one personal connection with somebody who is really in a way gifting you their story, right? Yeah. It, it, they feel heard and it's a gift to them. And yeah. also it's a gift to everybody who's impacted by that story and who sees themselves in that story or is moved by that story. So I think it's it's so important in that way as well. And also, you know, the impact of podcasting isn't just your audience, right? Right. It isn't just listenership. We've had a few, you know, production folks come on Podcasting Smarter and talk about this. You know, some of the impact that you're going to see within your podcast is from your guests, right? It's yeah. those personal connections you make. It's, yep. you know, and, and and that can be from a from a community standpoint, like we're talking about here, but also for businesses as well, you know? <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So it, absolutely. You know, it really, podcasting, I think, really allows people to connect on that personal level. And when someone's telling you their story or their explaining a part of who they are or what they've done, yeah. it really allows for that deep further connection. So yeah. It, and intimacy. It's great. It's a fantastic medium. <laughs> yeah. I that's why it. we're here. <laughs> yes. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, moving to Africa because the current majority of podcasts can be, 
U.S. or Western centric in perspective mm-hmm. and in location. So as, yeah. as someone who's Senegalese American, what inspired yeah. your move to Kenya? Because you had done all this work, you know, with Non on Record. So what inspired you to move to the African continent? It was really because I realized that over the years as I had traveled and I had documented and was building this archive and, you know, some of those um, stories would be distributed on national public radio or BBC and other places that I wasn't sure that I was actually, I was actually supporting these, this skill set to become part of the LGBT communities on the continent. I started to feel that I was traveling, I was, you know, collecting these stories and then I was taking them away kind of thing. Right. Yeah. And so I set I set with myself to think through what does it mean to do this work? How would it have the greatest impact? You know, uh, and so I I traveled to Nairobi. Oh, gosh, it must have been like 2007. Some so very long time ago. And I, I decided that I was going to start to train people on basically documenting as I, as I had been doing to build their own archives. And so I worked with about 12 LGBT organizations in Nairobi and supporting them through digital documentation. You know, everybody had Zoom recorders and, you know, it was like how to store your your media, um, how to keep it safe, um, what to do with interviews in case you, you know, you get pulled over or any kind of thing that we had to train people on in terms of building the archive. We were we were doing that. Yeah. Um, And as that ended, a group of activists approached me and said, you know, we'd really like to start what you're doing here. Is there any way that you can help us do that? And at that time, I was pretty much in my journalism career. I was in the beginning of my journalism career um, in New York City. Um, And so I didn't necessarily think I'm going to be moving now to Nairobi to do this full time. It just (laughs) never crossed my mind. Right. It wasn't like, oh, this is the next (laughs) natural step. Yeah, Yeah, it wasn't. I was like, oh, you all want it? Yeah, here. You know, I've raised a little bit of money now. Mind you, I'm you know, I'm a journalist, I'm a storyteller, you know, I'm not necess- I'm not an executive director at that time. I have absolutely no idea really what I had to do any of that yet. But I had I had been I had raised a little bit of money. And so I said, you know, I can support you all in terms of, you know, getting some resources for this. And if you want to set it up and all these different kinds of things. And I was very optimistic. I was like, this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> and I think there was a call like a month or so later that was like, okay, we really need you to like come and help us do this because we, we, and I was like, yeah, I mean, I didn't know what I was doing either (laughs) when I started this. And so I went back to Nairobi and that's kind of what began the process of me actually relocating um, and opening an office there. Um, An organization offered to fiscally host us. They offered to support us as we set up. And it's just like things started to fall in place in ways that I, I, I don't know if I like, looked for them, but they just started to fall in place. And so the next natural step was to meet for me to move to Nairobi and then to build out what would become Nana Record as an organization and, you know, have Nairobi as its base for the next, you know, 10 years or so. So it was it was kind of a following what was made available to me. Um, also, at that time, I was working at The New York Times and it was during the first it's when Trayvon Martin was murdered here in the United States is when I actually permanently moved to Nairobi. And I think for me at that time, too, it was just a feeling of not really wanting to be here in the United States, <laughs> to be quite honest. You know, things had erupted in such a way. Um, and that was such a it was just such a hard time, a disappointing time and just a time where I felt, you know, as a, a Black American person here that you know, I needed a break from that. I needed a break from what was going on in terms of police violence um, towards Black people in the country at the time. And so I walked into another another social justice issue, which would be uh, LGBT issues on the African continent, which was its own, you know, it could be a battle too. But it was, it was a combination of the perfect timing, which brought me to Nairobi and kept me there for almost a decade. Yeah. So in terms of living somewhere completely different, because there was that, you know, big kind of like ontological life moment, right, where you moved across the world and and there were so many factors there, it just being the right time to live somewhere very different. What have you learned from the stories and the perspective, but also the storytelling from Kenya, Nairobi, and also within the African continent in terms of how stories are told? Yeah. You know, I think it's just, this is such this is such an interesting question to me because I feel like the ways that stories are told are it's just about connecting to another human being. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. And then, and if that is is definitely your um your motivation for how you're going to tell the story and you're going to you're going to do 
the best that you can to be honest, to be emotive, to bring people on a journey, to to have things transform. That is literally the backbone of some of the best storytelling in the world. I think that for me, what I discovered was oftentimes when, especially telling LGBT African stories, there have been such poor reporting on African LGBT narratives. There have been just a focus on victimization. There have been You know, it had been wrapped up in some specific kinds of narratives that really permeated, you know, the cultural context in which I worked. And so when we brought in Afroqueer and even Nun on Record, when we were doing that work, it was basically shattering a lot of what was there. And so the way that people even on on the continent responded, you know, when we did um, Seeking Asylum or we did, you know, the Allies um, Project or we do Afroqueer, the way that people on the content response to that storytelling was so amazing. I mean, mm-hmm. it didn't matter if they were LGBTI or identified as queer or were straight, the way that people would respond to that, to the way that those stories were put portrayed, it showed that it was flipping switch or it was moving the needle a little bit. Sometimes not enough, but yeah. just enough. No, I've, I've noticed with some with the work that you do, the work that I've had the opportunity to listen to, it's that, you know, maybe you're speaking to someone because of a specific aspect of their life, right? Or because yeah. of a specific part of their story, but that's not their whole story. And yeah. I think that the ability to meet people as a whole person, right? And say, yeah. hey, maybe this happened to you or hey, maybe this has been your lived experience, but I want to, I want to know the whole you. I think that yeah. really resonates with people. It does. It does. And when you can, when you can, you can show that this journey is so similar to a journey that you yourself have had or someone, you know, has had that. I think that's like, cause it's also when we think of storytelling and social change, which also, by the way, as you know, a trained journalist was always something that my professors were always angry with me <laughs> about talking about, because I was like, there's no way for us to be objective. I mean, we should report what happens, but no one's objective. I don't think we should be saying that. I think it's it's, it's an untruth. <laughs> like, but, you know, I'd say, you know, stories, telling a story in a way, you know, in, a, in an honest way can really transform people. And, you know, they'd be like, that's not our job, but <laughs> that's my job. So. <laughs> right. And <laughs> this is I'm kind doing. of the difference between that, that journalism <laughs> yeah. lens, right. And then exactly. that storytelling lens. So one is, is saying this happened and the other is saying, Hey, I heard this happened oh. to you. Tell me about it. Right. And it yeah. kind of opens the door to that experience. Yeah. Like, um, how, yeah, exactly. How did this happen? And how did it change you? Or what did this feel like? Or, yeah. you know, what happened after? You know, and like that is what that is, I think, what made the storytelling matter so much. It it was complicated. It was complex. It wasn't just like this person was attacked or this person was kicked out of their house or, you know, this person couldn't be with the person they loved or, you know, you know, right. it was, it was and like it, it gives everything. their story. It fills it out. It gives their story, yeah. you know, perspective in terms of the the entirety of their lives. And I think that that's really yeah. important in all Humanity. storytelling. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's back to your initial question is I I feel that storytelling, I I think it's always a matter of perspective, of course, because, you know, if telling a story that's coming from Kenya or South Africa, Nigeria, Senegal's perspective. So the cultural context and, you know, language, you you know, the the things that, you know, being not being from some of those places, you won't know right away. Those are the things that you have to build into the story to make sure the story is, is as honest as possible, for sure. But the thing that bridges it all together is just that very human journey that makes good storytelling good storytelling. So that's a, a long way to answer your question. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. And and my next question is how do you decide which stories to tell? So we have a very good team that that will um pitch stories. So we 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 decided early on what what is an Afro story? Like we're like, what is an Afro story? How does it what is what's a story that we definitely would put on the show? And what, what's one that we wouldn't, right? So um, when I keep talking about this journey, that was always the fundamental thing of every episode that someone was going on a, on a journey and they were going to be transformed. Something was going to happen. We did we did try to do a whole season of really happy stories, which crashed and burned <laughs> in pre-production. Oh, no. Um, we really, <laughs> yeah, it was always that point where it'd be like, and then everything just fell apart. It was like every single time we had a running joke in the office that even when we had our best intentions of telling a happy story, there was always something that would come. But I think that was, that's life too. That's life. So that, that was always the case. Like when, when someone was pitching the story, 
So what happens? What's surprising here? What's going to keep people hooked that they're going to want to finish it? Are you giving us any new information? You know, is there drama, good or bad? You know, those kinds of things. And are we telling this story in a new and interesting way? That was always the other thing. Because we worked, you know, for a decade in the LGBT media space, we'd heard a lot of narratives. And there's a lot of specific kinds of narratives that get told over and over and over again. And we wanted to make sure we weren't telling those narratives in that same way. We really wanted to complicate how these narratives of victimhood and disempowerment were being told. So there was also parts of that that are important, that if someone is put into a situation, how does that situation transform them or how do they transform the situation itself? So that's also part of it. Yeah. Yeah, And how did they find that strength within themselves? It doesn't have to be the same story over and over again. And just for everybody out there, you know, the podcast is so well produced. There's a lot of work that goes into it. So can you just kind of outline some of that work? Because podcasting is, <laughs> is such a it's such a vast medium. And it is, you know, like we're here on a on an interview, like we're obviously not going to do as much editing as, as you guys do <laughs> for your yes. episodes. But <laughs> podcasters out there, you know, who like your work or who want to create, yeah. you know, similar narrative nonfiction work, what goes yeah. into that? Oh, gosh. Okay. So I think maybe if I take an episode and kind of deconstruct yeah, it, please. it'd be easier for me to... <laughs> I mean, people want to know because it it's something where I think when we're listening to podcast episodes, and, you know, you know when something is really smooth and honed and well-produced, but you don't necessarily know how much time that takes, how many people that takes, you know, yes, what the pre-production yes. process is like, yes, you yes. know, and, and everything that goes into it. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to take an episode called The Con, which is um, which such, a, such a fun episode to make, actually, um, because... There was a film called Dakan that was the first gay movie to come out of West Africa. And it was in French and it came out in 1997. I had seen it when I was coming up. I'd seen a little clip of it on YouTube. And I was like, what? How did they, you know, knowing what I know of, of, you know, the space and the context, I was like, how was this movie made? Who is this man who made it? Mohamed Khmer. And I would go down these Google you know, deep dives, I could not find Mohammed Khmer to save my life. And I eventually, it was always in the back of my mind, this film and how, and I knew there was a story there for years, but I just had no idea where the filmmaker was and how we were going to tell it. So we we sent a pitch out to the audience and said, hey, does anyone have any episodes they want to pitch and, and work with us to produce for season uh, three of Afroqueer? Um, or I'm sorry, season two of Afroqueer. And we got pitched the story from Moses Khmer. He said, I would like to find the filmmaker who made Dakan. <laughs> so I saw that and I thought to myself, me too. Yeah, so, that was exactly yes. what you had kind of already planted the seed on. Yeah. Yes, years ago. I was like, me too. We're doing this story. We're doing the story. We have to find. So but, but back then I didn't have the networks that I have now. So we we sent out messages to BBC reporters. We sent out messages all over the place being like, has anyone found this person? I think it took us about two and a half weeks. And, you know, we found all every person named Mohammed Khmer, but we didn't find the one we were looking for. So I guess about two and a half weeks. And finally, someone called us and said, I think the person that you're looking for is actually um, here. And so we traveled. We traveled. We sent one of our reporters out to do the story, to record Mohammed Khmer in Guinea, to talk about what it was like to make this film in 1997. And before we go, before we send the reporter, we're not just like, oh, my God, we found him. Go. <laughs> no, that's not how it happened. We did a pre we did a pre interview with Mohammed Khmer. So he gave us his his telling of what happened, of him going to Paris as a student, him running out of money, him meeting a very famous French movie star that he knew growing up. He said, hey, I would love to work for you. And he was an actor, he became an actor. And he just got tired of playing black roles in France and came home and said, I'm going to make a movie. And as he was traveling through um, a village, he saw two men kiss and it stuck in his head because he had never seen anything like that before. And Mohammed Khmer, also for the record, is identifies as a straight man. So he went home and he wrote what would become Dakan. And his process of trying to get funding, everyone said, no, 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 we're not going to do it. And finally, he convinced um, so people to fund the movie, um, some French funders to fund the production of the movie. And he talks about not being able to cast the movie and getting his brother to play the roles and all these different kinds of things that happen. And then eventually what happened when the movie was featured at Cannes and the vitriol that came towards him after. And, you know, people saying you're never going to make another film again, which is exactly what happened. So we did this whole pre-interview with uh, Mohamed Khmer. So we knew what the story was going to be. And then we fact-checked everything. <laughs> we fact checked. We looked for the audio. If anyone had video audio of him presenting in con, we looked for 
to make sure that the times lined up for when he was in Paris. We checked to make sure that his film did actually premiere at the, at the different places that he said in his narrative. And we could find, we could find record of all of that. We can find him talking about all of that. And so we pretty much could line up the story so that we could trust the storyteller to tell the story and believe what he was saying was true. Now, the human memory is what it is. So sometimes, you know, they maybe they didn't go for a coffee. Maybe they went for dinner. But, you know, that stuff we're, we're OK with. But, but the fundamental parts of the of the narrative have to be there. And we could fact check that narrative. And that was really fantastic for us. So once we did that, then our reporter went to um, Guinea and interviewed um, Mohamed Kamara, um, and he walked us through the entire story. And then Moses, who pitched the story to us, actually had opportunity to call at the end of that interview and ask questions himself. So we were able to also collect that audio. So then when it came back into um, our studio, we transcribe everything. And the initial producer takes a stab at what they think the story structure is going to be. What's going to be the beginning of the story? What's going to be the middle or kind of the, the heightened part of the tension? And then what's going to be in the third act or the resolution of the story. Um, and so we get that mapped out rather quickly. This is what we think the story is. There's four of us in that room. This is what we think the story is, you know. And yeah. so that I just producer, I just want to I just want to pause for a second. At this point, how many people have worked on the story? Five? So <laughs> no, one person. So, well, OK, no, that's not actually true. Well, one person has done some of the heaviest lifting so far in terms of, well, OK, so three people have worked on the story. And there's a producer, a reporter who's gone. If the reporter and the producer are the same person, that's a plus. That's one person. But by the time that comes back and they start doing that, they're probably working in teams now because you really do need another person's ear at that yeah. point so that you don't feel like you're lost in the weeds. So there's they're cutting and trying to put together what they think is the structure of the story. And then it gets presented to myself and another producer. And we go, that sounds really good. Or we say, eh. You know, I don't know if that's enough of attention there. I don't know if that works. So that's the kind of thing that's going to start happening at that point. We're going to okay. give them initial feedback to let them know if they're on the right track for the structure of the story. Then it goes back to them and then they start to write. Right. So then they're writing. They're now taking sound. So we know what the SOTs are going to be. And so they're writing through the SOTs. They're writing around them. We're getting a good sense of what the pacing is going to start to sound like. And then once that draft is finished, which I would say is probably the first full draft, then it's shot up to us again. Maybe not to me now at this point, because I'm, we have another show now, so I don't work so closely in all the shows anymore. But at that time, I would be working with the senior producer to look at that first draft and we would take a listen. And then we start doing, do, we start doing table reads where we cut and we cut and we cut. And it's hard. The first producer, I think, has the worst of it. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's their baby. And ju just, their for baby. Everybody, just for everybody yeah. out there, SOT is sound on tape. So it's when you sound hear like tape. a clip, it's when you hear a clip of a sound. Yeah, that's that's what that is. Yeah. So I, was, I, was, I went into popular uh, radio speak or audio speak. Yeah. So it's sound on tape. So anytime he was speaking, um, any anything we pulled from his interview was his sound on tape. And so then they go through another rewrite. I'll walk off in here. I won't come back now. But they'll go through another draft and then another draft. And by the time I hear it, it's pretty much almost ready again. So it's getting close to finished. So about here is when we know what everything is going to be. And now it's time to, to do for another final draft. And then we send it for mixing. So music, mixing, well, pacing, music, and mixing to final. I said that so fast. And that process takes a long time. No, that's, that was going to be my next question. Like, yeah, yeah. From the idea of the story when you say, okay, let's look into this, right? Or, okay, let's yeah. find this guy. Because you have the yeah. story, you know, kind of in your head in the yeah. background for years. But, you know, once you yeah. have that request from a listener and you're like, okay, we're going to do it. Yeah. What was the timeline like? Because, you know, you're literally flying to Guinea mm -hmm. <laughs> to do yeah, this interview I, and yeah. it's spectacular work. But, you know, for everybody out there who's like, oh, I listened to this episode and it was great. And it was an hour. Like, what's the timeline on that? <laughs> I don't even think it was an hour. Um, that took probably about three months to do. Yeah. Yeah, that took about three months to do. And I think it's also because there was another. So we we tried to work on episodes, two episodes at once, which is not always not a great idea for such a small team. <laughs> but we definitely have to because we we got to we usually have to be live and we have to publish the season by a certain time. Yeah. Um, so I think three months is about what it took to make that happen. And we sat with story and changed a lot of it. Um, you know, we have to get music rights and permissions for everything. Yeah. Any kind of audio that we're gonna we're gonna borrow, we have to get permission for. You know, it's 
So now we talk about that here at Podbean. We do talk about yeah. making sure you have yeah. your music rights. And we have a lot of links here through our help portal that really, you know, go into that. But it's yeah. definitely important. So I also just want to ask, like, at this point, you know, when it's final, you've published it, the episode's mm-hmm. out on, you know, you've uploaded it to Podbean, you published yes. it to all the directories. Yeah. At this point, you were saying it's three months, but obviously, you know, maybe it's scheduled within, you know, a greater mm-hmm. strategy for a season of it, of the yeah. show, specifically for Afroqueer, because that's the podcast we're talking about. But, you know, how many people have worked on it at that point? Like in terms of not in terms of, you know, how many, you know, hours or whatever, but like in terms of just the number of, I want to say like ears or hands that have touched it. (laughs) That kind had probably about five people. Right. And then then music and mixing and mastering and recording and fact checking and traveling to Guinea. You know, is it it's five at this point? It's about five people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And for everybody out there, you can do this work. It's just, you don't have to, you don't have to do have five, five people. people. No, you don't. But we are, we're a company now. Yeah. So we, we have just a bit more resources to actually yeah. put into the episodes. And I think that's something that is really important. And I think to be honest about it, is that we have a budget for the show. So we can, you know, fly someone out instead of doing a Zoom recording because we want the audio to be a specific quality of sound and we want to be able to control how the interview is going to go. So we'll fly someone from our team to go. And then we have we all of our editors work in-house. We have a studio in-house. So yeah. we do everything from start, from conception to final, all in-house. And so that is also why it sounds the way that it does. I think if we had more resources, we could do longer seasons. <laughs> it wouldn't take as long because we have more people. But yeah. I think... I think a team of five is pretty good, actually, for a show. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, and and it's yeah. really great to hear for everybody out there who's, you know, maybe a solo podcaster who wants to create this kind of work, but then, you know, feels like they're overwhelmed or, you know, can't do it at scale because mm-hmm. it is so a lot of work. And it's it's really yeah. cool to hear the breakdown of that. And mm-hmm. I, I kind of want to ask you because AQ Studios, I want to talk about AQ Studios and, and what the process of starting that was like, but also mm-hmm. the process of scaling your production as well. Mm-hmm. What was that like? If you can tell us a bit about that. Yes. I mean, we we definitely, we launched right before the pandemic. <laughs> it was like, we were like, <laughs> oh, this is going to be, we're going to do some amazing stuff. I mean, we were, and then the pandemic hit and we were already in production on two other shows besides Afroqueer. And it was yeah. full stop. It was like screeching halt, right? So for me, as you know, the CEO, I was like, oh dear, this is bad. This is bad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure everyone was having the same thoughts of variation of that. I was like, I need to keep everybody employed. We are not going to be able to distribute these two shows this year. I already knew. I was like, so we're going to have to scale down. So we actually used to have two studios, believe it or not. So what we did was we started to scale down and got rid of one of our studios. Everybody, most people were working at home and only the sound editor had to come in also because it was COVID time. Um, So that meant that we had, we actually took out a pretty major expense that we haven't replaced because we were like, what were we doing all those years? (laughs) But um, so there was just a lot of like restructuring that had to happen because I wanted to keep the entire team um, intact, but I also knew that we still had to produce something because that's just the nature of, you know, outputs and expectations and reports and things like that. So we took our second show and had to kind of put it on ice for a little bit while I put the team on figuring out the best way to record and produce Afroqueer without being able to travel. So if you listen to Afroqueer, a lot of the show, it's it's Pan-African in scope. So we're based in Nairobi, but we can have episodes that come from Johannesburg. We can have episodes that come from Lagos. We can have some that come from, you know, um, New York City or Minneapolis. Or So people are all over the world, sometimes even stringers. We'll hire people who work for NPR, BBC to go in, do recordings for us. All of that stopped. No one was doing it. Yeah. Um, and so we had to figure out how to still get the same quality show without being able to get the same quality audio even. Um, and so it was really difficult. It was a difficult time, but we were, we were decided, we decided we were going to take it on, which was great. And, you know, now in 2022, it's like the first year where we released our second show finally. And now the studio is starting to pick up steam. I mean, it's the year we probably won most awards this year for everything, which, which is like amazing to me because I really did feel like 
I don't know if we're going to, if we're going to make it to 2022 at one point, Um, Mm -hmm. but we did. And now, you know, we're in the position to start production on our third show again. And then there's another show that's coming up too next year. So it's just, it's just been a process. I think the pandemic definitely slowed momentum. That would, that's the best way that I can describe it. We hung on for dear life and now we're (laughs) on the other side of it. Yeah, you and made it through. We, exactly. We made it through. And now we are producing more than one show. We're about to produce two more. And I just think it's really, it's really fantastic to get to this, to this side of it. But it was really, it was a challenging time, made challenging because of the state of the world at that time. So, so that was an unusual time to launch a whole new enterprise. The the wild part is that was probably the time where our show, people start to listen to our show more than any time yeah, ever. Because so, everybody's at home. Right. Everybody was at home. Yeah. So Africa suddenly was really popular. Our numbers like quadrupled. And so even though we weren't able to grow the studio in the way that we wanted to, we got the the popularity of our flagship show like blew up. So that was great. That was like one of the best parts of it. And that also helped us to now, you know, have people to have faith in what we're trying to do now as we move the studio into its next phase. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. AQ Studio started with AfroQueer. And then, mm-hmm. you know, h- how did it go from one podcast to the studio? Yeah. So we really got into the idea of supporting new shows and new ideas. Are coming. We were getting pitched constantly, too. People really want us to work on their shows or they want us to um, house their shows or want us to pay for their shows. <laughs> we're always getting pitched for that. And so I said, you know, I think there's a really big opportunity for us to really focus on being a solid production house. And it was really it was really great for us because we're, we have such our strong, our roots are all in queer work. And so everybody knew we were a queer production house, because if you listen to Afro Queer, like, OK, these are this is a queer production house. So um, <laughs> it was niche. really great. Yeah, it was our niche. Right. But it was great because people who oftentimes probably would never have thought that they would be working with a queer production house suddenly were like, we really need to work with you to make this sound how we want it to sound. Right. And so it was a little, it was subversive in its own way, which was really exciting for us. But there's just so many different kinds of stories that, you know, we wanted to be part of telling. Um, and so we we began the process of looking for other shows that we wanted to to produce. So Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women is the second show. It's about to go into its second season soon. And then we have a third show that I can't talk about as much as I want to because it's so cool that's going to launch next year. It's just all along that vein of telling, you know, untold stories or telling stories in a different kind of way or, you know, giving um, a platform to communities that often don't get it. And so that's kind of the nature of how we we see our niche in terms of storytelling. And it's been it's been really great so far. Amazing. And and congratulations. You guys just recently won an International Women's Podcast Award. So Yay, thank you. That's so really incredible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's just been that's been fantastic. Yeah. And so, you know, c- coming from, you know, all the work that you've done, I kind of also want to talk about, you know, some of the success and opportunities that have come out of that. So is there anything you can share in terms of what that's been like on the other side? Because podcasting also a lot of the time is very solitary, right? Even when you're working with a team or you have a production house like you guys have built out, it's still like, you know, you're in the room with the team yep. and the oh, audio yeah. and, you know, and and it's it's very insular. So, I know it is. It really yeah. is. My, my social media person, I was like, Sally, we need some video of you working. I'm like, do you know how boring? <laughs> and like, what do you want? I Here's a selfie of me wearing I, headphones. Yeah. You know what yeah, I'm saying? Totally. I have nothing for you. <laughs> Yeah, and Lucas is like, just make it fun. I'm like, um, here I'm. I'm okay. holding up a peace sign. I'm smiling. I'm wearing headphones. Yeah. I'm getting like, a selfie. Not exciting. Yeah, but in terms of um, you know having the response yeah. of other people, which you did speak about in terms of you know not yeah. on record and some of the impact yeah. that that work has done, but you yeah. know coming from that as podcasting as an industry is coming up, you know being at the forefront of that with the work that you do and the quality of the work and the resources that you guys are able to put into the incredible production, you know, what are some of the opportunities or also just success that has come out of that for you? It's been really great. I mean, we were part of the PRX. The, we were the first part of the first cohort of the PRX Google Creators Program, which was mm-hmm. really instrumental in helping us to structure season two and got us a lot of support, plus a lot of press. Press is really important. Um, and so that was really, that was great. And then we were plugged into the, you know, the PRX network, which is tremendous and very skilled. So that's really, that was really fantastic for us. 
And then we, you know, we were nominated and up against some big uh, podcasts uh, for the Webby Awards. Like when, <laughs> when we were up against like Roxanne Gay's podcast, I was like, I don't know. I don't know, guys. I don't think this is going to happen. <laughs> But it was like, it's I think that's interesting though, because, you know, it, it, when everybody looks at, you know, award nominations or, you know, I yeah. think like when we're thinking awards, people automatically will think like the Oscars or, or film, but you know, yeah. it, it's very much, you know, when you make it and it's yours and then you see everybody else in the category, it's like, am I in that category? I'm in that category. Oh my goodness. I know. I'm like, let me now at, at Ro- you know, Roxanne yeah. Gay. Maybe, maybe Roxanne Gay will be like, what's up? You know, but it was really, it was really quite. That was really exciting, actually. It was very tremendous, like, to have our work recognized in that way. And then, you know, we got a lot of press. We were, you know, put on a lot of best podcast uh, lists. And yeah. um, a lot of people will recommend our podcast for lists for BBC and other things. And mm-hmm. that was just like, oh, wow, this really means a lot uh, to people. Then we won our first statue for the Anthem Awards. We won gold. Um, and that was that was cool because also that award just looks amazing. <laughs> it's like, oh, wow, you know, we have something in our hands. And then we were finalists for the One World Media Awards. And then now the International and Podcast Awards. Um, we are also finalists for one other thing, but it hasn't been released yet. So I'll talk about that. Well, we'll announce it later. Um, okay. So it's been a really, yeah, it's been a really good time. I mean, we we also have been on a lot of panels. You know, I just came back from Italy um, where they actually translated two of our episodes. And so by the time I was speaking, people had seen the work and they were so excited. And that was just really great because you know, to have your work translated into other languages so people can have access to it is so important. And so that was really amazing. So it's just been an incredible journey. Right now we're working in adapting some of our episodes for film, which has been another um, way of, of the work just growing, you know, and, and beyond podcasts, which is wonderful. And so it's just, it's just been such an exciting process with Afroqueer. Afroqueer is, you know, my favorite show ever. <laughs> it's my favorite show. Absolutely. It's, it, you know, just kind of to circle back to the beginning, it's sometimes we create the things in the world that we want to exist. Exactly. So that's such a beautiful full circle. Well, we asked everybody the same two questions at the end. So first, where do you believe the podcast industry is headed in your opinion? Oh my goodness. I mean, I really thought about this and I was like, okay, it could go either way. <laughs> Maybe it could go like four ways, <laughs> but I want to be, I want to be optimistic. <laughs> so um, I think in terms of podcasting on the continent, which is, you know, where we, we work from, even though we have a very global, you know, reach, there's just going to be more people making podcasts, but also more people making really high quality podcasts. I'm not one of those people who's like, oh, this podcast is not high quality. I'm not that person. Um, I am trained to make things a certain kind of way. And I like that way, but I listen to every kind of podcast. I will listen to everything, right? Because I think everything has value. But I think what we're going to start to see is, you know, people actually, you know, doing more high quality work um, on the content, which is really quite exciting for the industry there Um, and telling stories in different ways. I think there's going to be more narrative podcasts and fiction podcasts coming out, which is super exciting to me. I'm a big audible person. Like, I don't know the last time I read a book, to be honest with you. (laughs) Oh, so I love like listening to to narrative and fiction podcasts. I know there's a couple um, that are going to be coming out and a couple of people have actually approached us to support them producing some, which is super fantastic. Fantastic um, from the African um, perspective. I think what where we are going to see um, some real, some real, some real headway is looking at how people are going to support financing podcasts on the African continent. I think the U.S. has a has a much more, and I know U.S. based podcasters are like, "Are you serious?" No, I'm serious. The U.S. Mm-hmm. has more access to resources to produce podcasts, or you know, even if companies are. Um, willing to support, um, to hire producers to come in and produce podcasts. There's at least a bit of more of an ecosystem for that. I think that that is a space that's going to grow too on the continent moving forward as people see that podcasting is a real way to reach audiences. And I think that listenership is also starting to, to grow, especially with Spotify coming into the continent as it did um, the last couple of years. So um, there's definitely a lot more people listening to podcasts and more access to podcasts. So I think in, in the African context, we are at this period where there's an explosion happening. But just like the U.S., we're going to reach saturation too. <laughs> so that's where my <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it's it's interesting. You know, I think for most people that we talk to, the answer is growth. So that's pretty exciting to hear. Yes. And last question is, what podcast mm-hmm. do you like to listen to? What are your favorites? 
This question is tough because I think I'm the kind of person that goes through so many different seasons of podcasts. I came up listening to like This American Life and like Radio Lab and like, you know, I'm a huge fan of radio. Um, oh gosh, Invisibilia. I love Invisibilia. It's one of my favorite. I will listen to the whole thing over and over and over again. Um, but I find myself lately listening to a lot of much more conversation podcasts. Jay Shetty got me listening to every podcast. You know, yeah. I, I don't know <laughs> how that happens. <laughs> Jay Shetty is constantly on. <laughs> so I'm always listening to him. Um, <laughs> um, and then I listen to a podcast right now a lot. This is this is this is kind of where I am because of what I'm doing right now, but I listen to a podcast called Script Notes, which really talks about um the craft of screenwriting, because I'm actually writing a screenplay right now. So that's a lot in my earphones all the time. So it kind of changes depending on what I'm what I'm into or what I'm listening to. Um I did I've listened to so many fiction podcasts and a lot of audible original, <laughs> which have been really great, actually, um, fiction stuff um, in the last uh, few months. But mostly those are the podcasts I've been listening to. Like probably Script Notes has been my main one for the past few months. Yeah. Oh, fabulous. Well, Sally, we will have all of your links here in the show notes. Thank you so much for joining us and and all the ways that people can get in touch, follow you, reach out to you. And thank you so much for, for joining us on Podcasting Smarter. Thank you for having me. It's been so much fun chatting with you. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Podcasting Smarter. If you have any podcasting questions or want to get in touch, send us an email at podcastingsmarter at podbean.com. Thanks so much and happy podcasting. <laughs>